Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you for the welcome, Bernard. I, te- I was telling him back there, I just, I feel a lot of, out of sorts today because halfway here, uh, <clears throat> remember I was supposed to pick up my suit. I don't think I've ever stood in the pulpit without a suit on, so I just, I feel naked. <laughs> but uh, it is just, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see some some old friend friendly faces and to see some new faces, and uh what a beautiful day we have today. It's just uh, another reminder that we do have a good God who thought before he created. He thought of what we would see and what we would feel as we live and breathe. And uh, he put so much thought into his creation and into us. And, uh, you know, as, 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 as Bonnie's saying, though, we do live in a world that is tainted with sin and there are people all around us, and perhaps you yourself have, have at one time or another cried out, where are you, God? The world is hurting right now. It's easy to kind of lose sight of that sometimes, especially when you live out in the, in the community. We live out in the country. I mean, there's a lot of things we just, we don't have to deal with, right? It's a little different than if you live in downtown Dallas or something, there are people who are hurting this world. It hasn't quite touched us yet. We don't live in the Ukraine. We don't know what it means, most of us, to lose everything that we have. But still, even so, there's a lot of beauty in this world. So whenever I come into a, a church to, to preach, I have a burden. You know, as a pastor, when, when, when you receive the responsibility for a church, I, I, I believe that God kind of puts a mantle on you, and it's a weight. And you feel the burden for your congregation. You feel the responsibility for, for every soul that walks through the doors. And... Uh, I've had the privilege of serving on both sides of the pulpit as a layperson and as, as someone employed by the conference. And, and you know, I, I no longer carry the burden for a church, but I carry a burden for people. And when I'm asked to come preach someplace, I, I pray and I ask God, what does, what does this congregation, what does this group of people need to hear from me? What can you bring through me that might benefit them? And so I have a burden for people today. My congregation is not one congregation in in a geographical area. My congregation is everyone who crosses my path. That's who I'm burdened for. And so I do have a burden. As I look at the world, I see things shaping up and and I see the trouble in the world. And and you know on the one hand we have we have people who've, who've been saved for a long time and they want nothing more than, than to have an end to their misery and to have Jesus come so they can be reunited with their loved ones. And then on the other end, you have young people who haven't even seen life yet who still want to experience the things that God has made for us to experience in this world, to, to be able to grow up, to get married, and, 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 and you know, all the wonderful things that people get to do. And the thought of Jesus coming just to some young people is kind of a little, little, I mean, I'm not ready yet. And so we all have our different perspectives depending on where we've been at in life. And sometimes it's, it's easy to get caught up in what we want instead of what God wants. What we think we need instead of what God knows we need. When I was, when I was a a kid, there were all kinds of game shows on TV. You know, some of you may remember, if I throw out this name, some of you will have no idea who Monty Hall is. All right, let's make a deal. I remember watching that, people dressed up in crazy outfits and all kinds of stuff. Well, there was one, there was one game show that I like to watch. It was called To Tell the Truth. And in this particular game show, they had, they had a guest who was special in some way. Maybe they did something, invented something, or were related to somebody. But it was a special guest. And they had two imposters. 
And all three claimed to be that special somebody. And they had a panel of, of guest stars whose job was to ask questions and try to figure out who was telling the truth and who wasn't. So there was the real and there was the imposters to tell the truth. Now before I get into that, I want to just dwell just for a moment on the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, when Jesus told parables, everyone in the parable represented somebody that we could relate to. And so in the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's this poor guy that just, he's on the, he's on the road, he's taking a trip, and... Uh, he gets, he gets uh, stopped, he gets beat up and robbed, he took his clothes, left him there, naked, half dead. And in the story, a Pharisee comes by, a priest comes by, they kind of skirt their way around him, but they don't want to get near him. Now, I don't know about you, but I have always heard and even told this story in sermons, kind of vilifying them. Because they wouldn't stop to help this poor Samaritan. And just in case you didn't know, what, 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 well, he wasn't the Samaritan. But uh, then, along came, then along came the Samaritan, right? And the Samaritan stopped, cleaned him up, put him on his donkey, took him to him, and he, he saved him. So what does that story mean? And who is the Samaritan? Who is the Samaritan? Now, like I said a moment ago, often the priest and the Pharisee are vilified because they wouldn't stop to help this poor soul. Now, they had good legitimate reasons for not stopping. According to their beliefs, it would make them un, it would make them unclean. I mean, this guy was bleeding, and you couldn't do that if you're going on to to participate in a in a service in the sanctuary. You couldn't you couldn't touch him. They were conscientiously trying to be obedient, even though in their conscientious effort at being obedient, they were not obedient. It took this Samaritan. So what is the story saying? The story is saying that what the law could not do, somebody else had to do. And that somebody else was Jesus. What the law could not do was something that Jesus had to do, that only Jesus could do. You see, Jesus was a Samaritan. Now, if you don't know what a Samaritan is, back in the day... Whenever a country would come in and take over another country, they would take people out of that country. And so we have the story of Daniel and his three friends. They were taken captive from Jerusalem and taken to Babylon. And they would bring other people in from other countries to settle the area. And it's their way of subduing and maintaining control of the area. And so you had these foreigners who were brought into the area, and you had the remaining Israelites, and they intermingled, right? These were the Samaritans. They were not pure Jews. They were not pure Israelites. And so they were very, very, very low on the totem pole in that society. They were lower than a dog. They were lower than a woman. No offense to you ladies, it's not where we live today, but that they had a hierarchy in their culture. And Samaritans were at the bottom because they were half-breeds. Who was the Samaritan? How did Jesus come to be? There was that one night when the Bible describes very clearly how the Holy Spirit overshadowed who? Who? So you had the holy, the divine, overshadowing Mary, the human, the flesh, and humanity and God mixed. 
And Jesus will forever have human flesh. He will forever bear the scars of the cross because he joined his divinity with our humanity. He was the Samaritan. What the law couldn't do, it took the Samaritan Jesus to do. And and the interesting thing to that is, is the same thing happens to us when we are born again. That is the exact process of being born again when the Holy Spirit overshadows us and our humanity becomes joined with God's divinity, and we're born again. It's all the same thing. What the law can't do, it took Jesus to do. And God did out of love for us. Because we were that poor, blind traveler, that sojourner who has been beat up and ravaged by sin, left for dead. And our Savior came and picked us up. He cleanses our wounds. And he provides for our ongoing recovery. And that is a backdrop for my burden, that action that Jesus took to save us. There's a book that our church published years and years and years ago. For a long time, it was out of print, and they started printing again. I don't know if it's still in print, but I remember hearing about it, and then I finally got a hold of one and, and, and read it, and it made such an impression on me, and, and I have always believed that it is one of the most important and best books that we have ever published. It's a little book, a true story, called A Marked Bible. And if you have never read it, I'd encourage you to read it. It's a wonderful story about a young man who had a mother who cared so deeply for him, and, but, but you know what? As young men are often wont to do, he didn't agree with his mom, didn't want to live like his mom, and he was rebellious. And so he left, and his mom gave him a Bible that was marked with all the important verses. <clears throat> and he wanted nothing to do with it. And the story, just a short, you know, he kept trying to get rid of this Bible, and it kept coming back to him. Not the original one, but somehow throughout his life, this Bible kept coming back that was marked. Until one day, he'd been through enough trouble, and he started reading it. And through reading this marked Bible, he met Jesus. And his life changed, his character changed, his demeanor changed. How he dealt with the frustrations and angers in life changed. And it changed him so much that wherever he went now, he had this sense about him, this peace about him, this, uh, I don't know, but it was something that was so noticeable and how he acted around people and how he dealt with people that people, wherever he went, asked him, why? Why are you like this? Why are you so nice? Why are you so patient? Why? And he would tell them about Jesus. And, 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 and I love the story because I think it is, it is what we miss sometimes just as everyday Christians of how our life should be a testimony, not, not about giving Bible studies, not that there's anything wrong with that, but about the way we live, that it should be something that is attractive to others, that causes them to say, hey, I want what you have. And that's what that story is about. It's a beautiful story. I encourage you to, to find that book. It's not a long book, and it's a true story. The Marked Bible, a life that is touched by God, is a changed life. Satan's desire is to be God and to have what God has. He tries to emulate God, but he can't because his character is corrupt. Everything that he does is a reflection of that. He wants disciples. He wants worship. He wants a kingdom. He wants to be everywhere. What do we call that? Omnipresence. He wants to know everything. What do we call that? Omniscience. He wants to create life. He wants to be all-powerful. What do we call that? Omnipotence. Satan wants to be God. He wants everything that God rightfully deserves to have. He wants his worship. So in his effort to be God, Satan has a counterfeit for everything in this world that God has. Did you know that? 
It's easy for me to see, especially as technology just keeps growing and growing. Now, it's possible that a being can know everything just about that there is to know in this world, right? Because we have that wonderful thing, chat BT, you know, AI. All the knowledge of the world is being harnessed. I don't think that's by mistake. We have something called a World Wide Web, right? What does that mean? It means we're all caught in it. That's what it means. It is a way for somebody or a group of people who are being manipulated by somebody to know or to rather be everywhere all the time. You know, in China, they, they are now putting cameras in houses to monitor people. Keep them in line. We see the devil, if you would, developing his system of counterfeit godliness. He wants to be God, but he can't. And so he has to physically manipulate people and our world in order to get what he wants because he is not God. So there's a counterfeit for everything. If you look in the book of Revelation, God has his trinity, right? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, Satan has a trinity too. Did you know that? It's a beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. He literally has a counterfeit for everything that is God's. But the one thing that he can't do, he can't bring life. He cannot create life. He cannot bring back to life. Now we know they're trying, right? We see all kinds of things going on with cloning. Now we see robots and, and all these things. They're desperately trying to recreate humanity. But it's not us. It's not like creating a person. And the funny thing is, he's already given us the ability to do that, right? We get to make people. That's what we do. In the last days, when the mark of the beast is given, it's important to understand that there will only be two groups of people. Are we there yet? No. There will only be two groups of people. Both will be worshiping their God and trying to obey his will. Both will be like the God that they worship. The Bible teaches us we, we become like the God that we worship. That's why we shouldn't be worshiping gods of wood and stone and precious metals or whatever. We should worship the true God. God designed worship for that reason, so that as we worship him, we become more and more like him. But if you're worshiping the false God, you're going to become more and more like who? The false God. So both will be worshiping their God trying to obey as well, both will be like the God they worship, and their lives will be governed by the principles that govern the kingdom to which they belong. My concern is not for them. My concern is for the between now and then. How are we to live between now and then? We aren't at that point yet. We may be close. And we aren't there yet, so how are we to live? There's one camp that says, oh, we have to do everything we can to bring on the end. <laughs> right? Well, that's exactly what Judas did. Isn't it? Tried to force Jesus to take the throne of Rome. Tried to force him to appear as the Messiah. What are we to be concerned with? How should we be living? How should we be acting between the now and the then? That's what my burden is today. You can see the impact of the counterfeit all around us. Is, can't you? I mean, it's so easy to be moved to anger when you watch the news and you see what is being done to people. When you see it is what is being done to people trying to come into this country, whether you think that's right or wrong, there are things that are being done to those people. They're being used and manipulated, and it's wrong. 
the kids are, are <laughs> there's so many things that are happening that is just wrong and it's easy to be moved to anger. Especially when it touches your home, your child, your grandchild. <clears throat> and you look at some of the junk that they're teaching. It's easy to have your passions inflamed. And rightfully so, because it's wrong. It's so easy to take refuge in what we know. And it becomes easy to exclude. You see, when we are pressed by the passions and fears of our humanity, it's too easy because we know the truth. We know the future. We know who wins in the end. And so it's too easy to exclude and to judge those who are not with us. And so we cast a weary eye at those who don't believe exactly as we do. Why? Maybe we're insecure. Perhaps we see them as not being safe. We don't want want to associate with someone who might lead us astray. So here is the conundrum. There's a verse where they come to Jesus and they ask him about which is the greatest command and he answers them. And to step, to sidestep the point Jesus was making, someone asked the question, well, who's my neighbor? You know, if you just tell me who my neighbor is, then I'll be neighborly, right? That's what they're saying. Basically, they're saying, you know, I'm not going to be nice to anyone unless I know they're my neighbor. Then if they're my neighbor, then I'll do what you say. I'll, I'll love them. But if they're not my neighbor, so it's very important to understand and be clear about who's my neighbor. Clear that up, God. So I can make sure and do the right thing. Who's my neighbor? They wanted to be picky about who they loved. Jesus himself asked, Who is my brother? When pressed about the privileges of family ties, as he held a meeting in a a home, and there's a crowd, and his, his family wanted to get in, and he said, Who's my brother? Today, I want to challenge you with a question Who is a disciple? Who is a disciple? Jesus said, in our scripture reading today, in John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. How did Jesus love us? The Bible says while we were yet at enmity with God, Jesus was on the cross reconciling us to him. While we had hatred in our hearts for God, Jesus was dying to save us. That's how he loved us. And he says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, by this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you don't eat meat, right? Or if you go to church on Sabbath, the real Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath. Well, depending on which calendar you're watching, because some calendars now start on a different day, so it's not. So what he says, right? It says, by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, here's the thing. The foundation of God's kingdom is love and freedom. Love and freedom. You can't have one without the other. God gave that tree of of the knowledge of good and evil as a way of providing freedom for them to choose. Because without choice, there is no true love. God did not want robots. He did not create, you know, he did not create robots. He created human beings capable of allegiance and love and free will 
And he asks you to make a choice. Love me as I have loved you. So the foundation of of God's kingdom is love and freedom. And out of that love, out of that love for God, out of that love comes service for the benefit of others. We see that in the life of Christ, don't we? Out of that love for God comes service for the benefit of others. Members of his kingdom are united by their love for one another. The foundation of the counterfeit is force and fear. Force and fear. Because the devil can't win by love and freedom. He's got to force you to do it and make you so afraid that you'll lose your life that you'll do it. Or so afraid that you'll starve to death that you better swipe that food or whatever the case may be. Force and fear are his two main tools. And that's the foundation of his kingdom. And out of that flows service to benefit yourself. And members of that kingdom are united only long enough to serve their self-interest. And when their self-interest is no longer being served, see you later. We can see that, can't we? We can see that counterfeit kingdom at work today, can't we? It's a little harder to see God's kingdom at work, though, isn't it? Because sometimes we just, man, I don't know, so-and-so, they always bring that one dish to potluck. Or they, man, they show up to church to preach and they don't wear a suit. I don't know about this guy. You know, we, we have a hard time loving each other, let alone other Christians. We want to slice and dice and divide people up. And determine, well, we can love this one, we can't love that one, well, that one, uh, maybe not, not, well, maybe not the Jehovah Witnesses. We live, it is, <laughs> y'all remember the story in, in, in Daniel, right, of the statue with a head of gold and the chest of silver, the waist of uh, brass. And the legs of iron, and it's very clear, you know, prophecy was not given to foretell the future. Prophecy was given so that when it comes to pass, we would know there is a God. The only clear prophecy that we have, one of the clearest prophecies, is that of the statue, because there's an interpretation that is given by the angel right away. We know who the head of gold was. Historically, we know that. We know who the the silver was, who the brass was, who the legs of iron. And what's the last part of that statue? The feet of what? Iron and clay. And each of those were kingdoms that came and went. Where do we live now? We're we're in the kingdom of the feet, right? The iron and the clay mixed together. And I I used to look at it and think, okay, well, that's... Yeah, that's us. We're, we're li- this is the time we're living in. That's right. People don't get along. And, and God's people are the clay. And, and Satan's people are the iron. And I, and I had a realization not too long ago. My realization is this. You see, if you follow that, that, uh, that story, that prophecy, what happens to that statue? A great stone Made without hands. You ever want to do an interesting Bible study? Go through the entire scripture and look for that phrase or one similar to it, made without hands. It's very interesting. This great stone made without hands means with no human input. This stone, which represented Jesus, was his kingdom. And his kingdom did what? It came and smashed that statue to bits. And here's my realization. We may live in the kingdom of the feet, but I belong to the kingdom of the stone. And whenever the finality of the wrecking of that statue happens does not matter. 
What matters is that I belong to the kingdom of the stone. And the kingdom to which I belong is a disruptor to this world. It is different. It, it, it is the opposite. It is the antimatter of this world. My character, my demeanor should be different. It should be disruptive, not in a way that is dictatorial or forceful or using fear. God destroys that kingdom with love. God destroys that statue with love, the love that put him on the cross. I belong to that kingdom. And that kingdom have principles. And the foundation of that kingdom is freedom and love. And that freedom of love should lead me to service for the benefit of others. It should lead me to be that little Jesus, that good Samaritan, that sees the world around me as hurting, hopeless, naked, half dead. That leads me to want to pick them up and carry them and provide for them. That's the kingdom of the stone. So if there is going to be this worldwide movement of force and fear trying to get everybody to worship the beast, and this is my burden that I'm going to share with you now, if there is going to be this worldwide movement to force and entrap everybody with fear to worship the beast... Where's the counterfeit? Where's God's side of it? If there's going to be a worldwide movement for that, then brothers and sisters, there needs to be a worldwide movement of love. Not just love for fallen humanity, but specifically for love between God's disciples despite doctrinal differences. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now you're getting on some shaky ground. They're not talking about ecumenicalism. I'm not saying you need to adopt anyone else's beliefs or anyone necessarily needs to adopt yours. What I'm saying is, I need to be at a place in my relationship with Jesus that I can see my Baptist, my Catholic, my Jehovah Witness neighbor, whoever they are, if they're proclaiming to know Jesus, as fellow disciples. As fellow disciples. Man, that's hard. I have a hard time loving Amethyst sometimes. You want me to love a Baptist? Come on! We need to be able to love and fellowship with others who believe in Jesus just as easily as we do with fellow Adventists. Because here's the thing. If we don't, who is going to influence them for the kingdom of the stone? If we don't figure out a way to work together for each other so that we can rub shoulders and perhaps have an influence, how is it going to happen? Because everybody, even if possible, the very elect will be deceived if we are not ruled and motivated by love. Teacher, said John, This is in Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 41. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Man, I don't know. I've watched some of those TV preacher miracle workers. and <laughs> You know, there are people who have whole YouTube channels set up specifically to debunk all the other false teachings. They're false according to them, of course. I, there's one guy I've watched. He comes all the time. He, he, he picks apart and criticizes all the different Christian Music groups. Well, this one's good, this one's bad. And he shows their, their doctrinal... Fo- <laughs> Folks, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. We should not aid him. 
It's like that, 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 that old movie, The Parent Trap. My mama told me, not, if I can't say nothing good, don't say nothing at all. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything about, bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name, because you belong to Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. Folks, I, I, I'm not sure how to describe it, but I'm trying to do it because I work with people from different walks. And yes, sometimes it's, it's a little trying. Me and a couple of friends of mine started a Christian business person's networking group. It's not so much a networking group as pulling together Christian business people to encourage each other. They may not understand it, but I have a burden for that. It's to bring people together to love and serve them. Because they will know that we are Christians by our love for one another. We've got to find a way. It's not up to the preachers and the teachers and the evangelists. It's up to us who sit in the pews. It's up to us who live in the houses next to these people, in our neighborhoods, in our government. It's up to us. To love people in such a way that God's character is revealed. And they feel safe to come to us with their burdens and their heartaches and their sorrows and their fears. We might just have a chance to minister to them. I'm going to leave you with two quotes from from Ellen White. One is from, from the testimonies where she says, Actually, it's three quotes. If we just show a little more love, tenderness, and kindness, where we see one conversion today, we would see a hundred. And there's another place in the testimonies where she says that in the last days, people aren't going to be coming into the church because of the doctrines. They're out there. They'll be heard. I mean, you can go look it up on YouTube. You can ask Siri. You can go to Google. You can find out what we believe. She says they will come into the church when they see the love of God there. And finally, from Mystery of Healing, Christ's method of evangelism. Christ's method of evangelism is the true method. Jesus mingled with people. <sighs> Not that again. It's so much safer to pay an evangelist. (laughs) Jesus mingled with people. He sought their good. He gained their trust. He mingled with them so well that they called him a drunkard. How many of you are willing to do that? Oh, man, I've got a reputation. What do those people in Keene say? Jesus' method is God's method. He came down among us. He became sin for us. He identified with himself so close, with us so closely, so that we could identify with him and see him as our high priest, who's not untouched by our sorrows. Then he said, follow me. Folks, every one of us Self-included. We've got to learn how to love. And it needs to be here and now because it ain't going to wait for heaven. If we're waiting to to get to heaven to learn to love like God does, (laughs) there's a pretty good chance we may not make it. We need to be converted. We need to see people not as they are, but as how God sees them. Candidates for the kingdom of the stone. Father, thank you so much for giving your son Jesus to die for us, to become sin for us, to purchase our way of out of indebtedness. Thank you. We give you our hearts today. We give you our lives. Please work in us 
through your spirit. Work out the seeds of anger and hatred and misunderstanding and and jealousies and put the seeds of love. Put the gifts of the spirit in us. Help us to love. Help us to be full of joy and peace and patience. Change us, Father, from the inside out. Fill our hearts with such love for one another that there is not one soul in this congregation that goes without. Help us to learn on each other so that we can love the world around us. Walk with us today in Jesus' name. Amen.